Good afternoon. Welcome back to another episode of the Lord of the Rings LCG Progression Series. Today we'll be looking at the Black Riders box. First box of the Lord of the Rings Saga. We'll be looking at the cards. So let's dive in and take a look. As always, we'll be focusing on solo play. With a little bit of a nod to multiplayer. Let's take a look. First hero. We get four heroes for this box. The first hero is Sam Gamgee a leadership hero, 8th threat, so he's tied for the lowest threat in leadership, 3 one, one 3 health. So he's almost good on his stats alone. I think that's the highest questing value of any leadership hero. So that's good. The ability, after you engage an enemy with higher engagement cost than your threat, ready Sam, he gets plus one questing, plus one attack, and plus one shields until the end of the round. Well, if you're doing that engagement phase, the questing isn't going to come into play that much. But the uh, the attack and the shields and the action advantage are great. So, does that make up for him having three questing power when we prefer four, if we were going to use him as our primary questing hero? If you're playing against a deck where you're running low threat, yeah, I think it does. I think this is a strong hero. I like him. I'd run him. I might even run him in some non-Hobbit decks. But definitely in a Hobbit deck, he's really good. Not much more to say about him. I'd run him as the questing hero. And you'll also get some attack and defense out of him. He's good. Good, good hero. Uh, Mary, 6th threat. 6th threat is great. 2 questing, 0 attack, 1 shield. So his stats aren't good, although it's always good to have 2 questing and tactics. But his ability, Mary gets plus 1 attack for each hobbit hero you control. So if you're running all hobbits, he's almost a good attacker if you're running him as your primary attacker. After he participates in an attack that destroys an enemy, ready another character that participates participated in that in that attack. Action advantage is nice, but that one's pretty specific and you probably won't get a lot of uses out of it per game. Sam's you will. So running him as a uh, attack hero, we've got from our two first two heroes we've got one that's almost good at questing with a pretty good ability and one that's almost good at attack with low, and they both have low threat. That's interesting. They're both good in Hobbit decks for sure. Would you run Mary in not a Hobbit deck? He'd only have one attack probably. I don't think you would unless you really need a low threat hero and you don't mind basically not getting much at all out of him. So he's really good in a Hobbit deck. They're both good. We'll talk about the Hobbit concept in just a minute. Uh, Pippin, 6th threat, also good. 2, 1, 1, 2. Each enemy in play gets plus 1 engagement cost for each Hobbit hero you control. That's good after you engage an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat. Draw a card. Okay, so let's talk about all the Hobbit heroes together. I've talked about this in the past with deck building. Well, let's also mention Fatty Bulger. Bulger, 7th threat, 1, 1, 2. Terrible stats. Exhaust Fatty to choose an enemy in the staging area and raise your threat by that enemy's threat. Till the end of the phase, that enemy does not contribute its threat. That has some value. Uh, you wouldn't use him as your primary quester because you'd just escalate in threat too quickly. I'm not sure what his role is if you can't use him as your primary quester. I don't think you would ever run him over Frodo in the Spirit Sphere if you were not in the Lord of the Rings saga. And you could run Frodo. So let's talk about the idea of the Hobbit deck in general. I've talked about this before from deck building. What I'm looking for in a good deck is one hero that can quest, one hero that can attack, and one hero that can defend. My cri criteria for what is a good questing hero, I want four. Four questing ability makes him a good questing hero. If he doesn't have four to be considered good, he's got to have some kind of card or ability that makes up for it. Uh, the two that I consider the best questing heroes in the game currently are Eowyn, who quests for four, possibly five, if you uh, want to discard a card. 
and Glorfindel, who quests for three, but he can have the attachment Glorfindel, which adds an additional two per turn if there's a location out. Those are the two best questing heroes in the game. Glorfindel has, adds Asphaloth, which uh, add, adds two to his questing ability per turn if there's a location out, and those are the two best questing heroes in the game. Now, is there a Hobbit hero that can match either of those? No. Sam tops out at three. Three is good. It's not Eowyn and it's not Glorfindel. And when we're talking about whether a deck is good or not, or a concept is good or not, we're not talking about whether it's fun or whether it can work in, against some quests or in some situations. We're talking about if it's good against the very hardest quests in the game. And so when we're thinking about these cards, we're thinking, okay, first step, do we have a questing hero? We have one who's good, but not as good as currently available alternatives. Is there synergy that might make up for that? We'll see. Not among the cards that we've looked at, the four heroes, or other existing cards, but there could be. He's almost good at questing. Now, do we have a hero that's good at attack? Again, my criteria for a hero that's good at attack is four attack. If a hero doesn't have four attack, he's not a good attacking hero unless his ability makes up for it. Like, for example, Gimli starts with two. That's bad. However, you can buff him to five or six with damage on him, and that's exceptional. Bjorn has five attack as an attacking hero. He's great. Boromir has three attack, but he can ready up for one threat, which is phenomenal. So those are the good attack heroes. And Mary is, again, almost good, but not good. It's like they're doing this deliberately. They made an almost good questing hero and an almost good attacking hero, and they're expecting you to make up the difference using the low threat and, uh, and threat management cards to allow you to control which enemies you attack. And that, as a concept I love, in execution, however, you run into problems because the primary method of controlling the engagements is to keep stuff in the, engage in the staging area until you're ready for it. And keeping things in the staging area until you're ready for it requires you to have higher willpower to compensate. So do hobbits have that? I mean, in theory, if Sam had, let's say, four or five questing power, then we're talking about cards that can take on the hardest quests in the game. If Mary had three with a slightly better ability, a responsibility, then we're talking about cards that can take on the hardest quests in the game. As it is, we're talking about a fun concept with interesting synergy, but interesting in a way that doesn't really help enough to elevate hobbits to yes they can take the hardest quests in the game now they're fun to play and they're good they can definitely take on a lot of quests but we're not talking about a concept that is going to be your go-to for the quests you haven't been able to be for months or quests that will come out in the future that are just ferociously difficult for that, we're still going to be talking about heroes like Eowyn, Glorfindel, Elrond with Vilya. Yeah, that that's my thoughts on Hobbits. But I love the idea, and they're very close. And with additional synergies in the future, they could get there. But let's continue talking about the Hobbit cards and what their role is in the Hobbit deck. Bill the Pony. 2 cost, one one zero two 2 health, lower the cost to play build by 2 if you control Sam, so it's free with Sam. You're putting him in every deck where you've got Sam. Without Sam, he's under, he's overcosted for his stats, but he's excellent with Sam. Barlaman Butterbur, 2 cost, one zero one 0 bad stats, 3 health. If you each hero you control is the Hobbit tree, Damage from undefended attacks against you may be assigned to Barlam and Butterbur. So you play him, 
then you quest with them every turn until you need to take an undefended attack unexpectedly and then he dies. Well, I don't like to take a lot of attacks unexpectedly. If you're taking attacks that you do expect, he's not that good. He's not that good at questing. So he's a, oh no, I played bad card. Would you ever play him planning on taking an undefended attack? But not wanting it to go on a hero. Yeah. The, in particular against the Nazgul, he could be good at that. So he's got some uses in a Hobbit deck. I don't think he's going to be useful in every quest that you play Hobbits with. He's unique. He's going to sit there for a while. That's probably a negative. It'll be a contributing card, but it doesn't mm, add questing power to the Hobbits to compensate them for being a little just a little weak on questing relative to the alternatives. Again, we're looking for cards that elevate the Hobbit strategy to able to take on the hardest quests in the game, along with some of the other decks we've got, some of the other heroes we've got, and Barloman doesn't do that, but he can be a nice contributor. I think he's thematic in the Nazgul quest for sure. But he doesn't elevate the Hobbits to... Uh, higher status than they were before. Farmer Maggot. 3 cost, one two zero two health. After Farmer Maggot enters play, deal 1 damage to an enemy engaged with you. 2 damage if that enemy's engagement cost is higher than your threat. Well, most of the time we like to kill things on the same turn that we engage them, right? We don't like to leave them for multiple turns. You could play Farmer Maggot planning on doing that. He's not going to be useful every time. His stats aren't good enough on their own. Some of the time he's going to be good. Some of the time he's going to be a little bit less than good. So he's a little bit swingy, but the swing isn't going to be like, okay, he can be phenomenal, or okay, he can be terrible. It's going to be more like... Uh, he can be like a little, he can be good or maybe a little bit less than good, but that's his range. He's unique. He's like, he's very similar to Barlam and Butterer. He can be a contributor in some situations, but he doesn't elevate the Hobbits. Halfling Determination. They, they do seem to be making cards thematic to the Nazgul quests, at least some of them, too. Uh, so, like, not a box where you buy it and it's going to elevate your power against all quests, or you buy it and suddenly you've got new ways to be quests that were hard to beat before. This is a box designed, it seems, to beat the quests that are included with the box for now, uh, although Hobbits could be elevated in the future very easily if more cards come out. And one of the weaknesses of the Hobbits in general right now is lack of, uh, in solo play specifically, is lack of good uh, dual sphere or monosphere options. So in solo play with tri-sphere, the huge weakness is early game because typically in tri-sphere you've got, you know, you got one resource on each of your heroes and there are not a lot of one resource plays that are any good or that add anything to what you're trying to do. So you're usually not going to play anything on the first turn if you're running a Trisphere deck. I mostly run Dual or Monosphere in solo play now for that reason, because Dual Sphere you can run... Uh, now that we have more hero options, we can run two good heroes from the same sphere and then one other from another sphere, and then we've got a good turn one play a lot of the time because there's a lot of two-cost plays that are good contributing cards. But Hobbits don't have two good options from the same sphere. We could run Fatty and... Uh, Frodo, or Frodo and the Spirit Pippin, but Spirit Pippin's terrible and Fatty's not that good, so those aren't really that good an options. It's not like Eowyn and Glorfindel, who are a tag team that can't be matched right now, in my opinion, uh, for questing quests. They're not good for battle or siege, but Hobbits don't have a good duo sphere or, uh, or monosphere option, so we need more Hobbit heroes to come out that give a good dual sphere option, and that would definitely elevate the Hobbits for solo play. 
because it would make them stronger earlier. Could even elevate them to be good at the best quests if you uh, if say another tactics hero came out or another spirit hobbit hero or even a leadership hobbit hero came out that was really good it could hobbits could really be something but as of right now triosphere is not that good in solo because it's cumbersome early and we and usually against the hardest quests in the game you need a strong turn one which is really hard to have with the triosphere deck uh, halfling determination one cost event choose a hobbit that character gets plus two plus two plus two until the end of the phase so it's Duran song Duran song is good this card is good um good not great once again like with former maggot and barlaman it, it probably was worth the spot in a hobbit uh, deck especially against black riders i like that you don't have to be fighting a enemy with a higher engagement cost than you that's nice uh, yeah, it's uh, probably worth a look. It might get overshadowed by other cards. If It's going to probably be one of the first cards cut if you need to cut something, but it's good. can definitely be a contributor. This has been the case for Farmer Maggot, Barlaman, and Halfling Determination with Bill the Pony being an auto-include in a Hobbit deck. Smoke Rings. Two cost... Reduce your threat by one for each pipe you control. Each hero with a pipe attachment gets plus one until the end of the phase. Uh, okay. So is this meant to be like the Hobbit version of uh, Untroubled by Darkness or Astonishing Speed? Because those cards don't require you to have a attachment, they just work. Well, I guess I'll withhold judgment until I see what the pipes are, but this doesn't seem good. Plus it costs two. The Hobbits really needed strong spirit cards. Uh, let's take, take a look at Take No Notice. Lower the cost to play by one for each Hobbit or Ranger hero. Add five to each enemy's engagement cost until the end of the round. Okay. Uh... Well, when you're talking about stall cards, what you usually want is to prevent an attack. You want the option of engaging to get it out of the staging area, and then to be able to stop them from killing you. Keeping something in this staging area isn't that good. Just keeping something in the staging area isn't that good, but it can buy you one turn. This doesn't do that. It only keeps things in the staging area under certain circumstances, which is the circumstance being a turn when they otherwise would have engaged. It's going to be very niche. A lot of the time it's going to sit in your hand waiting for the right situation. Most of the time it's going to do that. Very niche card. Frodo's Intuition. That's a Fellowship card. Uh... I'm not going to review fellowship cards, I'm only interested in cards that can be played anywhere. For what it's worth, it's good. I mean, three drawing three for two cost, plus the plus one quest power, it's extremely good. But we can't play it everywhere, so I'm not going to talk about more than that. Hobbit Cloak, one cost, attached to a Hobbit hero, limit one per hero. Attached hero gets plus two while defending against an attack made by an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat. That's very good when you're defending against an enemy with an engagement cost higher than your threat. The problem with the Black Riders quest, uh, plug your ears if you don't want spoilers, there comes a time when you're going to be fighting the Witch King when he has an engagement cost lower than your threat in quest number two. And there's nothing you can really do about that. And so cards that try to buff up the Hobbits so they're capable of taking on a Black Rider are great, but this isn't one of them. This is a card that's good against other Nazgul, but it's not good against the Witch King, and the Witch King is the toughest one to beat. The Witch King section of the quest is the toughest one to beat, so... It's good, but not in every situation. It's good in a lot of situations, but not in every situation. I'd file this in the same category as Halfling Determination, Farmer Maggot, Parliamen. They're good, but they don't elevate the Hobbits. Dagger of Western Ease. One cost attached to a hero. Attached hero gets plus one, plus two if attacking with an engagement cost higher than your threat. 
Uh, same as Hobbit Cloak. It's good that you don't have to use it on a Hobbit. It's just a straight plus one. You probably will get that use out of that in a variety of decks. Probably. Yeah. Uh, plus one is good. Yeah, I mean, it's good, not great. It's worthy of a look in certain situations, certain decks. But it's not, doesn't elevate the hobbits, and it's not gonna, like, unlock new powerful strategies for you. Hobbit pipe. Okay, so we got a pipe card to go with smoke rings. Attached to a hobbit, limit one per character. After your threat is reduced by an event card, exhausted to draw a card, you might get one card out of that. Sometimes two. I mean, it doesn't make smoke rings good. Reduce threat by one for each pipe, and each hero of the pipe gets plus one. I mean, maybe if smoke rings was a zero, you could run these two. I don't know, maybe there's going to be more pipes coming later. This kind of implies that there will. Because otherwise it would say specifically with Hobbit Pipe, probably. Yeah, this doesn't, uh, this isn't a good combo. It's not a good card in general. Because it's too rare that you're going to get full value out of it, and full value isn't that much. Even if you were running Galadrim's Greeting and Elrond's Council, I don't think you'd get more than two, maybe three uses out of it if you're lucky and you get it out early. So a situation where you make it good is going to be too rare to call this a good card, so it's, it's a niche card. A fun card, probably. The pipe theme is probably a fun theme. Elfstone, one cost, attached to the active location, Attach attached location gets plus one quest point. After attached location leaves play as an explored location, the first player puts one ally into play from his hand. That's a phenomenal card. I'd play that in every lore deck. Every deck where you're running a lore hero, I'd play Elfstone. Unless you find yourself running out of cards really fast. But if that's not the case, this is a great card. And Laura usually has ways to draw cards, so this is a a great card. It's probably the only card in the set where I'd say it's a slam dunk. Really, really good card in, uh, in a normal deck. I mean, obviously, these are all Hobbit-themed cards. But this is a good card just for every deck, and I'd run it in every lore deck. It's very, very good. So, Hobbits as a concept, almost good, they're fun, they could be good later. Definitely would like to see a dual sphere or a monosphere option for solo play. Not quite strong enough questing, not quite strong enough in attack, they rely on the low threat, threat management, sneak by the enemy type of approach, and they don't have enough cards good at that. To justify it, I think you have to talk about the card, what is it, Hobbit Sense? The two cost neutral card that allows you to not be attacked or attacked. That's another stall for one turn card. I think it's better than take no notice, even at two cost. But that isn't enough to make the concept of the Hobbit deck one of the strongest decks in the game. It's good enough for sure to beat some quests. It's strong, but it's not strong enough that we're going to play it against the hardest quests in the game. So that's my thoughts on Hobbit. So if you're thinking about buying the Hobbit box for the cards, they're fun, but don't think that you're buying them and that you're going to unlock a strategy equivalent to the most powerful currently available. They're fun. They can work. You have to force it to work a little bit, but not too much because they're close to strong, but they're not the strongest. It's not like getting an Elrond with Vilya or a Glorfindel with Asphaloth was, where you're like, okay, this is, these are things I'm going to be using for a long time. I mean, Elrond gets used in the one deck, the most powerful deck in the game that I know of at the moment. That's a card where you say it's good because it's capable of taking on the hardest quests in the game. This, these cards are good, but they're not top tier. They're like second tier. With the exception of Elfstone, which I would put in a wide variety of 
lower decks where I have enough cards generally. So, thank you for watching.